Yeah. Well, good. We start. Um, uh, you, you may bring a chair there. Maybe you can shift. Good. Uh, great to see you. Uh, more people than I expected. Um, people at different levels, with different levels of knowledge. So some of you already work in loop quantum gravity, some uh, don't. Um, this will be quite intro introductory lectures. Uh, so I hope uh, not to lose those of you who know less. Um, however, I th hope they were going to be useful also for those of you who uh, know a lot. I'm trying to give a um, sort of a, a slow elementary introduction to loop quantum gravity, but uh, with all the main ideas. Uh, the way I view it now, after having worked on it for you know, 20 years more. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is to uh, give general ideas, give the basic mathematics, give the basic formalism, uh, try perhaps a few um, applications at the, uh, at the end. Uh, I don't know how far I will go. I want to go slowly. I want you to stop me, to ask questions, to um, uh, tell me if you don't, if you're not following. Let's uh, try not to get lost uh, uh, and uh, have no fear of uh, um, saying this is not clear, uh, whatever. Um, there are a lot of books now on loop quantum gravity, many, by many people. Uh, I have two books. Uh, this is the two 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 2004 quantum gravity. It has uh, the main uh, conceptual structure, it has the main discussions about space and time and how to rethink mechanics, how to rethink quantum mechanics, uh, um, all that, quite detailed. Um, but it doesn't have uh, uh, the development of the last 10 years, which were quite crucial. Um, and uh, this is much more recent, and uh, it's more introductory, um, uh, and it has the theory as I understand it today. Uh, basically, there are other books by other people. I'm not going to list all of the, all of them. Um, refer to the books about the qu equations, not what I write on the blackboard, because notoriously I write plus instead of minus, three instead of two, and things like that. So don't trust the details of the um, <coughs> um, of the equations written in the on, on the blackboard. Most of them are in the books or in the papers. So I refer to the book or the papers for precision. Um, I have uh, put a Dropbox, I've created a Dropbox with uh, um, the PDF of the books, um, a couple of recent papers, I will probably uh, add some to which I will refer, some even this morning, and uh, a couple of the, the old basic papers, for the, 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 the three main papers from which things developed. Um, the Dropbox, uh, I can uh, I can send you an email with a, with the link of the Dropbox. But if you go on my web page, just Google Carlo Rovelli, you go on my web page. In my web page last night, I put a link at the beginning. There is a, a quantum introductory quantum gravity course. Uh, there is a timetable and uh, a link to the Dropbox. Um, so it's easy, easy, easy access. Uh, you don't have to buy the book. If you buy the book, I get the royalties. I'm happy. All right. So that was for for introduction. Let me start. So loop quantum gravity. That's what we're talking about. LQG. <coughs> uh, uh, now, what it is? It is a tentative theory for describing the quantum behavior of uh, the uh, gravitational uh, field. Um, so um, it's tentative uh, theory for quantum behavior of gravity, which since we have learned 
uh, from Einstein is also the quantum behavior of space-time in a sense which is important to clarify and I will clarify um, at the beginning. Why is tentative? Because we have no um, uh, solid empirical support of it. Uh, so uh, we start believing a theory to be a good description of the world after it has given verified predictions, new verified predictions and for the moment we don't have any my hope is to see verified prediction to be tested before uh, <coughs> uh, before dying this thing has been developed for more than 20 years maybe 30 now um, it uh, comes in a number of variants with different formalism within uh, canonical formalism, covariant formalism within each formalism there are variants of the theory um, so Various people you talk to in the in the, in the community, uh, you get different perspective on it. Uh, m the majority of things are in common. Um, the community now is maybe what two hundred people, three hundred people in the world, depending how you draw the perimeter of the community. There are uh, sort of bi-annual conferences, uh, maybe a dozen or, f or more groups in the world that study. Uh, uh, loop quantum gravity and uh, the main applications so far are two to early cosmology and to uh, black holes. Here in Marseille we mostly uh, recently have been focusing on on, uh, uh, on black holes. Uh, for cosmology there is a very large community which is called loop quantum cosmology. Now um, the aim of the theory, this is uh, important for avoiding uh, confusion, is not to have the theory of everything. I don't believe we are any close to a theory of everything. We have no idea what's out there. We don't know what's dark matter. We don't know what happened at high energy. Um, it's not to uh, write the final arrival point of science or anything like that. <coughs> it's just to describe the quantum behavior of gravity or the quantum behavior of space-time. Why? Because we have very well established theories that work spectacularly well, far better than it was expected when I was your age and was studying. We have three of them. <coughs> um, everybody's surprised by how well they work. Uh, they seem to uh, describe everything, be able at least in principle to describe everything you can see, except a few things, dark matter being one. Um, but clearly, they don't describe uh, uh, the quantum behavior of gravity, um, which has direct implications because we don't know uh, what happens in some actual areas of the universe. For instance, uh, we now know that this universe is full of black holes, many, uh, millions. We, we know them by name, we observe them, we're building a huge telescope, the, um, uh, event horizon telescope which is a radio telescope uh, by putting online many radio telescopes on the earth and we're going to very soon to have images of the black hole at the center of the galaxy the Sagittarius A star big big black hole at the center of the galaxy million suns we see stuff falling in in that black hole and in other we see the accretion disk with, where, where we know that uh, matter is rotating spiraling and falling in so we know that matter falls into the black holes we know more or less what happened to matter because we have very good theories that tell us. So the cross the end horizon, go inside, we can, we can theoretically follow what happens. What happened next, we have no idea. Okay? We really have no idea. So you take a stone, you throw it in a black hole, you can compute. We are told at school that we can compute what happened in physics in principle up to difficulty of calculations. Always, it's not true because you throw a black hole, it goes to the center, it gets to the center and then what? We don't know. We need a quantum theory of gravity because that gravity definitely is in a regime where we expect quantum effects and we need a quantum theory of gravity. So, that, so quantum theory of gravity purpose is to describe this corners of the universe where the present basic theories don't, uh, don't work. Now, <coughs> before listing um, uh, the, what we know about the universe, let me start by saying what we have learned recently about the universe. Um, there is a 
false rumor that goes around that we have no empirical information whatsoever about quantum gravity. That's wrong. We have a lot of empirical information about quantum gravity, and we keep getting one. So <coughs> what is the empirical uh, information we have? And I'll start from from the re recent one, and then I'll go back to the, to, to the general one. So one crucial, um, it's a few months old, and is the discovery, um, it's a couple of years old, and is uh, the, the actual measurement, the detection of gravitational waves. And uh, a few months uh, ago, in fact, October uh, 17, if I'm not wrong, there was the observation of this uh, uh, neutron star uh, merging. Now, neutron star merging uh, is, is a spectacular observation because um, uh, it confirms a lot we know about the neutron star. It confirms general relativity um, in the strong field regimes. Uh, but the most interesting aspect of that observation, which is a few months ago, is that it was observed by uh, the gravitational wave um, um, uh, 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 apparatus, LIGO, and uh, and not Virgo, Italian French as usually didn't see anything. Um, but it also was observed by a lot of uh, electromagnetic uh, telescopes in the optic, in the radio, in the high energy. It was observed by everybody. Um, so it's big boom up there, and we observe that things. Now, the signal, the gravitational signal and the electromagnetic si signal arrived uh, uh, together within a second for one another. A second could be an effect of the explosion. Now this is a very far away thing, so it means that um, the gravitational and electromagnetic signal has tra traveled together at the same speed. Okay, So if you put the numbers in, the distance and so on, um, the uh, neutron uh, star merge so 17, um, uh, tell us that the speed of propagation of the gravitational waves uh, divided by <coughs> the speed of light is 1 with a precision uh, in one part um, in 10 to the minus 15. That's what we, what uh, uh, you find from the astronomers who have uh, who have done this calculation. Now, before this observation, so six months ago, this ratio, which is of course a key, if you want, fundamental property of nature, was known in one part in ten or one part in a hundred, from binary pulsars, from from other things, because of course we had indirect observation of gravitational waves for long. So this means that with a single observation, we have improved the knowledge of this ratio by 10 to the 14, um, by 14 order orders of magnitudes. Okay, by what a million, uh, whatever it is, a thousand billion, whatever um, uh, times. Okay. Now why is it is interesting? Because a lot of tentative theories of quantum gravity, other tentative theories of quantum gravity, are based on modifications of general relativity, where this ratio is very different. It's not one. Okay? It's widely different. So in one observation, um, we have uh, almost ruled out, certainly put a lot of um, empirical pressure on a large area of research. Nature is saying no, 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 no. That doesn't seem to be the right, uh, the right direction. So we're learning. We're learning things relevant to um, to quantum gravity. The second uh, observation, which is a few years old, um, I forgot the date, three or four years old, four or fives, uh, which has taken everybody by surprise, um, by big surprise. In fact, I would say. The majority of theoretical physicists have been shocked. It was not expected. Um, not all the theoretical physicists. Is uh, no supersymmetry observed at LHC? 
Um, in fact, many theoretical physicists expected the supersymmetry to observe the already at lab um, before, uh, but uh, when LHC started a few months before, I remember uh, going to Switzerland, to Geneva, and talking to them. Um, theoretical physicists there, and uh, I remember them say, telling me, come on, Carlo, it's certain we're going to see supersymmetric particles. Well, it's not certain because we are scientists, we're open to big surprises, but come on. Um, we have so good many indirect arguments for low energy supersymmetry. There is string theory, there is dark matter, uh, there is naturalness. Uh, it's completely different areas of our knowledge that point to the same thing the existence of low energy supersymmetry. We're going to see them as soon as we turn LHC on. Now, LHC has been on for years. No sign of supersymmetry. There are articles that you find online easily say no sign of supersymmetry on LHC. <coughs> now, why is this relevant? Uh, again, it doesn't rule out directly any um, theory of uh, quantum gravity, but it definitely puts stress on the direction of research that somehow uh, was led to this prediction. Uh, let me make a parenthesis here before going ahead. Um, so a parenthesis about uh, uh, sort of philosophy of science um, and methodology. We, we all have learned about Popper, right? We all know something about Popper. Um, and Popper told us uh, that uh, you don't really uh, prove theories, you falsify theories. Um, you don't really prove somebody right, but you can prove somebody wrong. Um, so Popper sort of sketched uh, this idea that science worked by proposing theories, testing them, uh, to the extent in which uh, nothing that they say contradict reality, they might be okay, and then when they predict something which we don't see, the theory is wrong, we discard it. Now, this is super interesting. <coughs> it's super interesting, especially as a demarcation criterion. So uh, separating what is science from is not science. Um, that was proper real aim, was not to describe how science work, was to find a criterion to separate science from non-science. So astrology, um, make prediction, you test them, it's just false, it's just factually false. Or there are other <coughs> um, things which are, could be extremely interesting by themselves, there's no negative judgment in them, but they don't give pre testable predictions, so they may be interesting, but they're not science. Science is testable prediction. But somehow, um, uh, people have taken Popper too seriously, saying that uh, th taking this as a description of how science works. That's not how science works. What, the way that science works is that you have a theory, uh, the more its predictions are verified, the more you believe it. The more predictions are not verified, the less you, predict, you, you believe it, because you can arrange things. Right. So what actually happens is that you have a degree of confidence in the theory, which goes up and down. When general relativity came out in 1915, uh, nobody believed it, except Einstein and maybe Eddington. Um, uh, then there was Eddington measurement, and so, wow, maybe that's right. Then uh, there was, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, the calculations of the solar system in the 70s, and people wow, wow, this is, is right. Then black holes were fine. Then in the 30s, uh, there was the expansion of the universe. And then there was observation of gravitational waves. So now the theory is extraordinarily rely is considered extraordinarily reliable in its domain. We know where are its limits. There's an enormous amount of confidence because we have added the, the Maxwell equations, have had so many confirmations that in their domain of validity, everybody believed them. Okay? Nobody questioned the Maxwell equation in their domain of validity. To the point that if somebody, write, people write to me, I have proven the Maxwell equation wrong, I don't even read the thing. Maybe I should, because who knows? But no. And similarly, uh, most theories are abandoned not because of a clear Popperian falsification test, 
Sometimes it happens. This was sort of one. Uh, but most of the time, you just abandon them because they're not fruitful. They don't, they don't go ahead. So this description of science in terms of fruitfulness, in terms of degree of confidence, which was more Bayesian, it's called today, uh, close to Lakatos' description of science, uh, um, even Kuhn in a sense. Uh, it's, it's my, why I'm saying all this? Why I'm making this blah, blah, blah? Because uh, it's important for, for scientists, I think, enormously. You don't take seriously everything which is not being self-falsified. That's a mistake. And I think a lot of physicists today make this mistake. It has not been falsified, therefore it has to be taken seriously. No. Bullshit. Okay, uh, I have a theory that there are little green dragons, the other side of the moon, that hide very well every time we see them. Okay, can you falsify it? Maybe, but it hasn't been falsified yet. Do you take it seriously? No, it's bullshit. So it's not the absence of falsification that it's a good criterion for T. So if you have a colleague that studies some strange Lagrangian, and you say, why are you doing that? Uh, and he says, why not? Can you prove it wrong? It's not a good scientist. Okay. We have never found anything about the world by randomly looking at things which have not been falsified. Right? We have found things new about, about the world by looking at experiments, by doing a contradiction within the theory, giving hint, getting hints from nature, because we are not smart enough to get, to get uh, any theory. So, uh, no supersymmetry at LHC does not falsify supersymmetric theories. Maybe falsify the minimal supersymmetric standard model. I don't, I don't, people tell me that I'm not an expert in there. But there are other supersymmetric models that you can, you can turn parameters. But the degree of confidence in that direction goes down. And goes substantially down. I mean, people are in trouble. People say, well, maybe I should study something else. That's the way science, science works. Third recent uh, um, uh, observation or set of observations is uh, um, Lawrence violations. That has been a big story, a beautiful story, because uh, there have been a, a, a number of attempts of uh, uh, writing a quantum theory of gravity which breaks Lorentz invariance. It's much easier. If you're allowed to break Lorentz invariance, it's much easier to write a, a, a a, 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 a consistent, mathematically consistent quantum theory of gravity. In fact, one example is um, Hojava Lifsic. Um, we just write a Lagrangian, which is something that uh, uh, X and T are treated differently, and uh, poof, you get a renormalizable Lagrangian. And since non renormalizability was, main, was considered the main difficulty of Einstein theory, uh, wow, it's so easy. So, therefore, that's very good. Because you have a prediction, so it's good science. It's not, I'm not saying that studying alternative theory of quantum gravity or studying supersymmetric theories or studying theories that break Lorentz invariance is bad science. It's good science. Immediately you have a prediction, namely that Lorentz invariance is broken. Where? At the Planck scale. At the, Planck, at the scale where you expect quantum gravity effects. So people started writing possible violations, profit, uh, studying writing terms that violate uh, Lorentz invariance and uh, make prediction about them. And uh, this was 10 years ago. And it prompted a sudden interest of people in astronomy to test this. And in fact, there was even a moment in which the first indication seemed to be positive. I got very excited. I wrote a um, research proposal because magic, magic is one of these telescope things, uh, we're detecting some uh, uh, light coming from some sudden burst uh, far away where uh, the blue and the red were arriving at different time. So blue and the red, the, the high frequency, low frequency, they were uh, separated by a delta t. Now, this is a clear violation of Lorentz invariance if the, 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 the red and the blue, different frequencies go at different uh, speed, because you have a different dispersion relation, right? It's like in a crystal. A, in a crystal, light doesn't go at the speed of light, because it interacts with the crystal, and uh, uh, the, the slowing with respect to the speed of light depends on the frequency, so frequencies go at different speed. So the idea is that, well, there's a Lorentz invariance um, breaking at the Planck scale. Planck is very, very small. So 
the, the speed of the different colors is, very, is, is slightly, slightly different, but if you look something very, very, very far away, you detect it on the long. So magic kept telling that, uh, keeping data, and it just disappeared. It experimentally disappeared. I'm not going into detail of the of the of the of how you you test that. It's just not complicated, but a bit technical. Um, but then there are a lot of other tests, uh, and. Uh, um, the, the, there's some globular cluster, the bullet cluster, in which there's some phenomena that depend, uh, they're strongly characterized by the fact of being um, Lorentz invariant. And uh, nowadays, uh, uh, there are bounds, there are uh, uh, bounds on Lorentz invariance violation. Which are very large, the order of ten to the six. So, <coughs> if uh, ten, or ten to the minus six. So, if if the Lorentz invariance, vi so the violation Lorentz invariance at the Planck scale, they are very small. Uh, or in other words, Lorentz invariance has been um, tested uh, at the Planck scale with remarkable precision. Now, of course. It might be that there are other Lorentz virus effects, not the ones that have been tested. So once again, we're not falsifying the idea that Lorentz invariance is violated, but uh, nature is saying no. So come on, I mean that doesn't seem the direction to go. The nature seems to be, uh, as far as we see, Lorentz invariant all the way to the Planck scale. Um, and the theories that try to solve the problem of quantum gravity by breaking Lorentz invariance under enormous empirical stress. Okay. Once again, I mean, if you have a theory that there are giraffes in the Alps, uh, it doesn't. It's not killed by the fact that you go hiking in the Alps and you don't see giraffe. Maybe they're just you know in the forest you didn't see them. But if many people go in the Alps and nobody sees giraffes for very long. And if people studying giraffes say, well, they need heat, and there's no, it's cold in the Alps, and so on, so on. After a while, you just forget studying a theory about giraffe in the Alps. So if you keep studying supersymmetric particles of low energy, Lorentz violations, it's like studying giraffe in the Alps. It's not Popperian falsified, but it's under enormous um, stress. Good. <coughs> so what do we? What do, these are recent results. Uh, that tell us about nature. It doesn't seem that um, the the kind of alternative to general relativity studied uh, are uh, experimentally favored. It doesn't seem supersymmetry, at least a low energy, experimentally favored. And it doesn't seem Lorentz violation to be experimentally favored. What do we know? So what are the positive things we know about uh, the world? Well, as I said, uh, what do we know? <coughs> about the world. We know three things, uh, but we know them very well. And uh, uh, this is the three theories I mentioned at the beginning that whose success everybody was surprised. And uh, you know what they are. <coughs> it's quantum theory, quantum mechanics, um, general relativity. And the standard model. Now, what is shocking about all three is that nobody took them very seriously at the beginning. Um, when I was a student in, in uh, Bologna, in Padova, and then uh, started going around in London when I, I was young, uh, nobody took the standard model seriously. Everybody was sure that it was going to be changed. The standard model was young at the time, it was basically just put together. <coughs> and everybody expected it to be violated uh, next week, next month. I remember when um, Carlo Rubia 
uh, was going. He got the Nobel Prize, and he uh, was going around uh, saying that he had seen uh, what was it, the W, um, the, the, the 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 intermediate uh, uh, boson <coughs> vector bosons. Uh, that in fact confirmed the the, the buying uh, Salam part of the standard model. Um, he was giving the talk. Uh, he was experimental and saying, "Well, in fact, we're already having the data. We already see the violations with respect to standard model. So, data not very clear yet. But you know, next time I'm giving a talk, we'll, you will see what's wrong with the with the buying Salam theory." This was uh, 35 years, 30 years ago. I mean, it's 30 years that every talk. From experimental, I hear, well, it's just a standard model. We're already seeing some little violation. Next time we'll be sure. 30 years, always the same. Okay? So the standard model is incredibly successful. Right? So 30 years of everybody expecting it to be wrong, and everybody saying, well, actually, we already have hints. Next week we'll see. Yes? Uh, why do you not place thermodynamics in there amongst the pillars of science? Is it sort of subject? <laughs> Thermodynamics. Dynamics. <laughs> that, I'm not sure it's spelled correctly. Um, uh, there is a sense in which it is even more fundamental than the rest, and there is a sense in which it is not, because it is not um, a sort of um, list of basic stuff of the world and basic equations. Uh, it's <coughs> um, something about the behavior of a lot of things. And uh, we may spend time to, to discuss that. So it's a little bit different status. Uh, um, and uh, um, um, people like Fermi and uh, Landau, even Einstein, at some point said, this is something we know much better than the rest, thermodynamics. Uh, so they are on your side. <laughs> uh, other people would say, well, come on, this is just the behavior of many particles together, which is fundamental, but in any sense. It's, uh, fundamental is a, it's a funny world, because it means at, at the basis, but at the basic with respect to which ordering. There are many possible ordering of things. It is relevant for quantum gravity, and uh, we, I may say something at the, at the, uh, uh, quite ahead. Now, general relativity is even worse. I mean, general relativity, nobody believed black holes when I was a kid, right? I mean, I remember my general relativity class, the teacher saying, well, black holes is a solution of the, of the Einstein equations, but kids don't believe there are actual black holes out there in the sky, right? This was 75, uh, Sinus, the first black hole was actually already observed. People were still debating whether it's a black hole or not. Nowadays, nobody would say that. People would say, well, maybe a black hole on the long term behaves differently than what we expect, but nobody would say that these things are not well described uh, by general relativity. And the observation of gravitational waves uh, has been a test of general relativity in the strong field regime, which is a regime where, which was the regime where GR was a little tested. So, general relativity has been a spectacular success, far more than what people expected. And quantum mechanics, uh, it's another of this story. I mean, you keep reading on the newspaper, wow, new experiment, fantastic result, incredible, has been done, blah, 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 starting from Aspet and now uh, the, the Chinese with, a, with, a, with a entanglement of particle. And the great result is that quantum mechanics is right. The equations written by Heisenberg in 1925 are right. Okay. So the great surprise is that the world is described by quantum mechanics. And there's people still surprised by that. It is described by general relativity, it's by Of course, we don't expect that this is the end of the story, right? Because uh, there's no quantum um, theory of gravity. And of course, uh, general relativity certainly goes wrong. Uh, sort of when h bar is different from zero, so small actions. Uh, uh, quantum mechanics most likely has to be readapted to take into account uh, uh, general relativity. Quantum mechanics, it depends on what you mean by quantum mechanics. If by quantum mechanics you need, uh, you mean uh, uh, the core of the theory, which we're going to go through, uh, we have no hints for saying wrong, it works very well. But if by quantum mechanics you mean the Schrodinger equation, the Schrodinger equation doesn't fit with GR because there is no T 
there is no external time in GR. So the Schrodinger equation must be rewritten to quantum mechanics. So, so must be sort of at the very least adapted to GR, which is what Dirac started to do, and it's uh, it's the way we use quantum mechanics, or to adapt it to GR. The standard model we don't know. It has been tested up to what? F few TeV, 10, 10 TeV. Uh, what happens at higher energy, uh, sort of larger than 10 or 15 uh, TeV? Nobody knows. Maybe there are other particles. Maybe there are other. Certainly, we have no idea what is dark matter. So, could be some other particle. Could be black holes. Could be. It's hard to think there is a modification of GR after that, but who knows? So this is what we <coughs> this is what we know. The um, um, and it is my understanding of the way that science works that if you want to understand the quantum behavior of gravity, we have to base it on what we know and not base it on some uh, fancy new idea pulled out of the sky, because fancy new ideas pulled out of the sky usually don't work. So um, the way loop quantum gravity work, works is uh, uh, to ask the question whether we can write a quantum theory that has generativity as its classical limit. So in other words, when we can write a quantum version of the theory such that in the h bar going to zero limit is general relativity and that's what the quantum gravity is now to do that um, the key point is to in my opinion to take seriously the physics we know the standard model is not much relevant to gr uh, to quantum gravity because uh, quantum gravity means uh, uh, um, uh, quantum gravitational phenomenon, which I uh, expect it to be a much higher energy scale than this one, so it's not clear what it tell us. What it tell us, but quantum mechanics and generativity are the uh, the core. So loop quantum gravity is a way of doing quantum gravity, sort of taking generativity seriously, taking quantum mechanics seriously. That's what we know. Can we put them together? No fancy other stuff. No supersymmetry. No strings. No violate. No change of the theory. No, can we just be theoretical physics? Take this, take that, bring it together. That's the way um, Maxwell worked when he tried to put electricity and magnetism together. That's the way Newton worked when he tried to put uh, Galileo physics and Kepler physics together. That's the way Einstein worked when he tried to put Newton physics and uh, relativistic physics together, and so on and so forth. So, based on what we know, so. The starting point is what is what are this theory telling us, and uh, um, I will spend time in that. And uh, starting from uh, generativity, um, and uh, later on also about quantum mechanics, uh, uh, I think that a lot of uh, energy in quantum gravity research is spent by trying to do theories which are not really relativistic or not really quantum mechanical. There are a lot of research out there which is called quantum gravity, which is not quantum theory, and a lot of research which is called quantum gravity, which is not general relativity. I am suspicious that this is going to work. Both these theories are strange with respect to our common intuition. Very strange. Quantum mechanics is unbelievably strange. Right? Entanglement is hard to digest once you put your hands in it experimentally. General relativity is even stranger in some sense. I mean, tell us about things about space and time which are funny, very funny. So by bringing them together, I think this is quantum gravity. Uh, merge th and digest um, the strangeness of the two. And uh, I'm going to start from, from there, from uh, trying to clarify what generativity uh, tells us, and then it will be a rapid uh, build up of the uh, of the theory. So <coughs> I close with one uh, other sort of philosophy of science uh, consideration um, to justify what I just said. Um, there is another well 
uh, known philosopher of science, which is Kuhn. Where is the H in Kuhn? After the U or before the U? Before? before? No, no. After. After? Like that? Yeah. Oh, whatever, Kuhn. You know who I'm talking about. Um, Kuhn also, it, it, it's very famous and uh, it's very well known among physicists. Uh, and uh, um, he told us great things about science. Um, and uh, he gave us this image of science which uh, uh, works, 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 then has a crisis, and then in, in a crisis sort of everything goes wrong and you start from a different foundation. So you, you, you change the foundations. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a philosophy of science that sort of clarify the fact that science is a process. It's not just a, 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 a a big building that you build and you add pieces is a process in which you you keep changing even even the foundation. That's certainly correct. This historical vision of science is certainly the good one. We learn a lot from from Kuhn, but like for Popper, um, it also had a bad influence on science. The bad influence is that uh, if you if you take Kuhn or at least the Vulgata, the the, the version of Kuhn that uh, that is common among scientists, you get the impression that science is not cumulative. That every time you start from zero and you throw away all the rest. And we are taught that, right? Somehow um, Newton arrived, dis discarded everything as a new foundations. And then uh, uh, the 20th century arrived, Einstein discarded everything as a new foundation. Quantum mechanics discarded everything as a new foundation. And uh, you have this image of science that uh, um, what you knew before is irrelevant for what you build after. That's bullshit, okay? If you read Kuhn carefully, that's not what he says, but that's the way Kuhn is always. Uh. So you have this idea that in a great revolution you can discard everything, and uh, once again you can, out of the blue, pull out new. If you look at the history of science, history of science is cumulative. We learn things which remain true, right? We learn that the Earth is round, and it's still round. Now, it's not exactly round. It's a, an orange, and in fact, it's a pier, and it's a mountain, and we can learn. But it's mostly round. That's what we learn. It's not flat, it's round. We learn that the Earth goes around the Sun, and it still goes around the Sun. Now, general activity is complicated because there is no absolute space, blah, 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 but it still goes around the Sun. It's not the Sun that goes around the Earth. It's a fact. We learn that there are electromagnetic fields, and that light is an electromagnetic field. It is an electromagnetic field. It's still true. We learn that there are black holes, that space-time is curved. It's curved. It remains curved, right? We keep learning. With the standard model, we've learned plenty of things. There, 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 there are these particles. They are there. I mean, it's not. So we deepen our knowledge. We change foundation. We see things from a different perspective. But we don't go back. We don't unlearn things. After Copernicus, those like Tycho Brahe who said, well, uh, I can do better, so let's go back to the idea that the Earth is the center of the universe. Th this, is this is dead directions of science. I believe that what we have learned about uh, Lorentz invariance, okay, there's no preferred frame. It's a fact. Galilean invariance even. We're not going back to a preferred frame, like we're not going back to the Earth of the center of the universe. We will not go back to a fixed space-time after general relativity. We will not go back to a classical theory after quantum mechanics. We are going to learn more. Maybe the world is going to be more strange, more complicated, uh, but we don't unlearn what we have done. So this idea that maybe what you have learned before is wrong, that's not science. Of course, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what is the key thing that will remain with us, uh, but science is about adding knowledge and interpreting previous knowledge. It's not about discarding previous knowledge. So, <coughs> uh, loop quantum gravity is, is strongly based on this idea because uh, the source on which it's based uh, is just quantum mechanics and general relativity. Uh, and uh, somehow it is in contrast uh, with many other attempts to do um, quantum gravity, where you think, well, well, after generativity, we don't really believe 
what it says, or quantum mechanics, we don't really believe um, what it says. So <coughs> this is a general introduction about where we are, uh, where is loop quantum gravity. Um, and this was basically the first hour. So in the next hour, I will start um, with uh, a careful discussion of uh, uh, what we have learned about space and time in generativity, and especially the discussion will be what we mean by space and time. Because in quantum gravity, space and time are going to necessarily mean something different than generativity, like <coughs> the electromagnetic field uh, of the Maxwell equation is not the same thing as the electromagnetic field of QED. Right? In QED there are photons. Of course, there is a clear, we understand very well the relation between photons in Fox space and the electromagnetic field of, 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 uh, of, of Maxwell equations. Um, we need to understand equally well the relation between quantum gravitational field and uh, the gravitational field uh, of Einstein of generativity, which is space-time. So space-time has to be rethought quantum mechanically, but for doing that we need some clarity of what we mean by space, what we mean by time. So I will give in the next hour a discussion about space, what we mean by space, which is far from obvious, and is, I think, needed to build a quantum theory of gravity. Time I'll deal later, because first I will talk about space. And after that, we do some math, and we start building the theory uh, technically. So now we take a 10-15 uh, minutes break, and uh, then there's a discussion about space. Okay?